We're back again on our study of spiritual gifts. This is session 34 on the spiritual gift of miracles. In the last session, we talked about healings. We said that it is many kinds of healings. It might be physical, it might be mental, or emotional, or relational, or spiritual. The one we usually associate with it is physical. But I personally have experienced relational healing and emotional healing, and there are many people with this gift who do help us heal and become whole once again. In this session, we're going to talk about uh, a related gift. That is the gift of miracles, and it's the last one of the gifts that have sometimes been called the miraculous gifts or the sign gifts. And it is also the last one that's associated with the hand. And I will mention that often the spiritual gift of healing and miracles become confusing. Which is healing and which is miracles? Isn't a healing a miracle and isn't a miracle healing? In two sessions from now, we will talk about gifts that often are confused with each other. And we'll try to separate out which gift means what, so that we can understand these gifts a little better. In the very next session, we'll move to the feet and we'll talk about the gift of apostleship. Scholars in general, and theologians in particular, they love to debate, to argue. If they didn't argue and debate, there wouldn't be a job for them. So they love to present their opinions back and forth, and most of the time, nobody really knows the answer. But it is helpful because it allows us to think a little deeper about issues than we might, because the people who have spent time studying these issues, that's what they do. And they've spent a lot of time thinking about it and bring up points that we have not thought previously. Do the sign gifts, the miraculous ex gifts, exist today? I've said before three factions. It's very simple. Yes, they do. No, they don't. Maybe. And I clearly fall in the first category. I think, yes, they do. I love the point that was brought up in the last session. Why would God do all these healings throughout the course of the Bible and then suddenly stop? I believe that also applies to tongues and interpretation as well as miracles. God is a God who is consistent, a God of order. And we have seen evidence in our modern age of these gifts being used. Many of us from countries that are industrialized, that are developed, we haven't seen these gifts. Perhaps because in, we are saturated with the gospel. People have numerous opportunities to hear the message of Jesus Christ. But it may be in the less developed countries, what we call the developing countries, where they have not heard as much about Christ, where these sorts of gifts are used. We do know that the gifts of healings and the gifts of miracles, as well as tongues and interpretation, are called sign gifts because they are a sign to those who are not believers that God is real, that God exists, and He's there for them. The belief that I have that these gifts exist today is a belief shared with a very illustrious group of scholars throughout the centuries, including Augustine, St. Francis of Assisi, Martin Luther, John Wesley, and Martin Lloyd George. These are all well-known, well-respected uh, people, religious figures, and I feel I'm in good company. To be fair, there are also many illustrious, well-known people on the other side of the issue. So in closing on that part, I'll just say, the debate ensures that there is full employment for biblical scholars. They will be able to continue with their jobs. 
In the summer of 2000, an evangelist named Saluka went to preach in the marketplace of a village in India. A beggar with an advanced case of leprosy asked him for money. Saluka replied, I don't have any money, but he offered to pray for the beggar. The beggar said that he would be grateful for the prayers and he was healed instantly and this miracle greatly surprised both of them as well as the townspeople. They had known the leper for many years and within a few months the man's entire village had come to Christ. Now if you're interested in finding out about miracles today I have found a wonderful website that I would encourage you to go look at. It is called Megashift, M-E-G-A-S-H-I-F-T dot org. This organization is a ministry specifically dedicated to documenting miracles that have taken place in the world. And most of those have taken place in less developing countries less developed countries, those that are on the edge of the frontier of the gospel. So I would, I would encourage you, go and look to find out miracles still happen. Healings still happen. God is still God and He's doing extraordinary things around our world, perhaps not where we live, but surely he has told us to go into all the world, and there are miracles taking place there. Would you open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? You know that many gifts are listed there, and we have talked about almost all of the gifts. In fact, there's only two more gifts for us to talk about after this session. And in 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to go down to verse 7, and we'll read through until we come to the gifts of miracles. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given the, the Spirit, through the Spirit, the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by that Spirit. To another miraculous powers. Will you please note once again, both words are plural, miraculous powers. It is indicating that there's one, more than one kind of a miracle. And that is very true. The gift of miracles, the word miracle in the Greek means donamis, dunamis. It is G for 11. It is the same word that we use for dynamite, an explosion, something so powerful that it's noticeable. And I love that picture that the Greek word actually means literally acts of power. Sometimes we will call people dynamic or that person is a dynamo. And what we mean is they're very active. They're very energetic. They're moving around. They're, they must have a lot of energy within them to be able to do all the things that they do. This is what the gift of miracles is all about. Releasing tremendous energy, power, that accomplishes God's will in a given situation. Well, Thayer's lexicon says that the gift of miracles is power for performing miracles. It is the power. It's like the petrol that you put into your car to make sure the car goes. So it is the power to perform miracles. It's strong and powerful. Some synonyms, according to uh, Thayer's, is force, power, might, power that's manifested, it's seen, it's revealed. Vines says simply, it's power in action. 
It's not power for power's sake. It's power with a purpose. It's like using dynamite in a mine. You use it to be able to continue expanding the mine. There's a purpose. Dynamite's not just put in there so that everybody can watch a big explosion. It has a purpose. The power behind the spiritual gift of miracles always has a purpose, and that purpose is always aligned with God's purpose in the situation. The word is used 118 times in the Bible, and sometimes it refers to the power, and in other occasions it re refers to the miracle itself. So it is both the power and it's the actual miracle. The definition that we're going to use is to demonstrate God's power to unbelievers, to demonstrate His power to unbelievers. Uh, in my country, we get together to celebrate our independence on July 4th. Most of your countries have one date in which your country marks as the point you became a country. In our country, we get together and we have a celebration and we set off fireworks into the sky. Perhaps you do the same thing for your celebration, but it is a wonderful demonstration of power. It takes a lot of power to shoot a firework way up, maybe a thousand feet into the air, and then tremendous power for it to explode and be a brilliant color that comes down to earth and delights and excites the crowd. So those are the examples. It's demonstrating power. The demonstration in my illustration is watching the fireworks. Wonderful demonstration. The purpose is to validate God's existence to unbelievers, much as it was with healing. And as you can probably tell, these two go hand in hand. They're locked together. It's very hard to distinguish one from the other. It is possible, but almost always when you see miracles, you'll see something related to healing. But there are times where there are, there are miracles that have nothing to do with healing. The role of this gift is both to expand the church as well as to provide a witness to non-believers that God is in existence, that He is real. What gift mix is included with this? Well, as I said, healing is often hand in hand with the person who God uses to perform miracles. It's often used with a gift of apostleship, which is the very next gift we'll talk about, which has to do with someone going to the frontiers, often it's missionaries. The gift of evangelism and the gift of faith. Many times these are the gifts associated with the gift of healing. And again, just as in healing, intercession is also the basis of releasing this power. Asking for it in prayer, watching God answer that prayer and initiate the miracle commentators. Chuck Smith, a miracle is something that is humanly impossible to do. But when God is the agent doing the work, it's absurd to talk about the difficulty. He talks about that there are dangers for people, cautions for people where God has worked miracles through you. It is, you may use miraculous powers for your own benefit. If that's the case, the power source is not God, the power source is Satan. Secondly, he says, it is dangerous because you may take all of the credit for what just happened. And that is something that occurs with every gift. There is always a danger that you yourself will get all of the glory, but the Bible says God will not share His glory with another. So when you try to take credit 
for something that God does, you have violated a clear command of God, a clear instruction that I won't share my power with anybody. Everything that has happened with spiritual gifts comes from God through the Holy Spirit. And as humans, as the ones who are created, it is wrong for us to take credit for something that only the Creator can do. David Gusick, he writes, When the Holy Spirit chooses to overrule the laws of human nature, God is visible. And this is really what it is. There are certain laws in physics, in human nature, that operate behind the scenes. They just operate and we know. I throw something up in the air, I know that gravity is going to push, pull it back down. A miracle would definitely be God deciding, I'm not going to have that come back down. I'm going to allow it to be suspended up in the air. Now, I've never seen that take place. I don't know that it ever has. But the point is, there's a law of nature that God's instituted so that His universe runs smoothly because He's a God of order. One of them is that there is gravity and you can't defy that law. That law exists every time that you're on a planet. There is no gravity in space, but on earth there is. He also gives, David Gusso also gives the example of pilots flying an airplane. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but pilots don't really fly the airplane, at least passenger jets. There's only two times that they have manual control over the plane, takeoff and landing, which are the most dangerous parts of the whole flight. Then the pilot's flying the plane, making sure that it safely gets up into the air and safely back down to the ground. Once it gets up to cruising altitude, the pilot puts a little switch on and the plane runs on autopilot. He says that the gift of miracles is when God decides to flip the switch on autopilot off and he takes manual control of what's about to take place. That's an interesting analogy. Uh, because God does have certain universal laws that operate that He has instituted and they are not violated, at least not by human power. But it's when God in His infinite knowledge and wisdom and in accordance with His plan decides this is a moment where I'm going to demonstrate my power. Then He says as the master pilot, I'm turning off the autopilot and I'm taking control and you will see a miracle. I want you to think back to Jesus walking on the water. We talked about Peter walking on the water, but the very fact that either of them was walking on water defies the laws of human nature. You do not walk on water unless there's stones right underneath and nobody sees them. You cannot walk on water. And when Jesus walks on the water and he comes into the boat and he falls asleep in the boat and they land, the disciples say, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? It was a miracle. And the disciples, though they were with Jesus constantly, recognized that this was something that does not take place in life. And something without explanation made it possible for Jesus to walk on the water and they knew that they attributed this to God and they looked at Jesus with new eyes and said, what kind of man is this that he would be able to stop the wind and still the waves and walk on water? It's a perfect example of how God chose to flip off the autopilot and say, I'm going to walk on the water. 
Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown also have an opinion that miracles are special and extraordinary power, such as uh, inflicting death on a person just by a word. And there are examples of people who, like Peter, where Ananias and Sapphira tried to uh, fool the people, and in a sense trying to fool God that they were not completely honest in selling their property and giving all the money to the poor. And Peter says to Ananias, how foolish. Uh, you know, you, the people who uh, are at the door are here to carry your body out. He says the same thing to his wife, Sapphira. The people who are at the door who carried your body out are here to carry yours out too. Boop! Zap! Dead! defies the law of human nature. It was a miracle. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Now the visual aid that I would like you to use is a very simple one. A huge explosion! A massive explosion! And you see all different colors of reds and oranges and yellows exploding into the air with massive power. That would be a good visual aid to think of miracles. They are supernatural acts that temporarily suspend the laws of physics. And they demonstrate God's power and authority to unbelievers so that they might come to Christ exactly what happened with healings. Now would you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3 and we'll see another example of a miracle. And in this case, it's Peter working with a man who is a beggar and has a crippled arm. Peter in the early days of, of Acts, the church, was the leader. But over a period of time, Peter's territory remained Jerusalem and Paul becomes the central character of Acts as his extends out into the known world. Starting at verse 1, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple court. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, and Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, Look at us! So the man gave them his attention, expecting them to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk! Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, yes, the man was healed, but it also was a miracle because that isn't supposed to happen just at a word. And I like the fact that in this miracle, there was something required of the person who was receiving the benefit of the miracle. And that was, look at us. And so he did. He could just as easily have healed him without saying, look at me. But he wanted his full attention so that what was about to happen, the man would understand, was not a trick, was not some magician's ploy, but it was in the name of Jesus Christ. Because he says, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. 
In this case, the man was responsible. He had a step to take. Look at me. And because he looked at them, the faith was released for God to do the miracle of healing this man. And the others recognized it and they were filled with wonder and amazement. It does not say they came to Christ, but it certainly says that they recognized that something very unusual happened and they could not explain the reason why. Here's a personal example. None. I've never seen a miracle. About the closest I've come to a miracle is watching my children be born. I can never understand how anyone could go, go through the miracle of childbirth and not know there is a God. It is a moment that is indescribable to stand there and see this life come out of your wife and be born and be a separate life. That is truly a miracle. A miracle is not when you see Ivan coming to work on time and you say, that's a miracle. He showed up on time. Instead, it's where the laws of nature are defied. But here's one also from the Megashift website, megashift.org. In 1995, three women evangelists in China try to preach the Word of God. An unbeliever appeared and began cursing them nonstop. After the evangelist paid no attention to him for some time, other non-believers started asking why the woman wasn't being told to be quiet. Why were they even being kind to this, this woman? At that moment, the, man who, or the woman who was cursing the evangelist fell to the ground dead. The witnesses were awed and many accepted Jesus Christ. How saturated is the gospel in China? How many of the one billion Chinese have had the opportunity to hear the gospel message? Probably not a lot of them. As we've talked about before when we talked about diversity in the kingdom, there are more people coming to China every single day than in many, many other countries. But when you talk about one billion people, that is the frontier of the gospel. Wouldn't that be the place that would be a wonderful demonstration of miracles that people, such as this case, would accept Christ? Yeah, I think that would be. And go to this website. There are many examples, not just healings, not just striking someone dead, but other things that are unexplainable. You cannot look at them and say, how could that have happened? I have some questions for you as I've had in the past, and would you apply these to yourself? Maybe this has happened to you. Maybe, in fact, it's happened to you and you've been somewhat embarrassed to tell anyone else because this does not usually happen. Admit it to yourself that God did do something miraculous through you. Or as you hear the questions, you may find yourself being drawn to those questions, saying that this is something I would love if God did through me. Question number one, has God worked through you to believe that God can do the impossible if he chooses to do it? Second question, has God worked through you to be a witness of his power that defies the laws of human nature. And number three, has God worked through you to perform a miraculous deed that becomes a platform to share the gospel? Do any of those apply? Have any of those happened in your life? Are any of those things that you feel your spirit being drawn towards that you would love it if God did that through you? then perhaps you do have the gift of miracles. In the next session, we will move from the gifts of the hands to the two gifts associated with the feet. Next session, apostleship, the final spiritual gift, will be evangelism. So please join us next time.